Once he was sent to the National Treasury to arrange for the mortgage of several hundred peasants. The estate concerned was extremely run down. This had been brought about by disease among the cattle, dishonest management, poor harvests, epidemics that had wiped out the ablest workers, and finally by the incompetence of the landowner himself. This landowner, by the way, had been busy redecorating his Moscow home according to the latest fashion, and had spent everything on it, down to the last kopeck, so that he hadn't enough left to buy himself food. Thus, the remaining assets had to be mortgaged. Mortgaging to the National Treasury was new then, and people made use of it with certain misgivings. Legal agent Chichikov began by getting into everyone's good graces, since, as we know, nothing can be obtained without such recourse, not even an answer to the simplest questions. At least one bottle of Madeira must be poured down every throat. Thus, having gained the good graces of all concerned, he explained that about half the peasants had died off, so that there should be no misunderstanding on that point. But, the secretary said, they're listed in the census. They are indeed, Chichikov said. Well then, what are you worrying about? The secretary said cheerfully. One dies and another is born. That evens it up. This inspired Chichikov with an idea as brilliant as any that had ever occurred to mortal man. I'm really a simpleton, he said to himself. Here I am looking for my gloves when they've been before me the whole time stuck in my belt. Why, all I have to do is buy up those who've died before the new census is taken. If I offered, let's say, a thousand rubles for the lot, I could then get a mortgage from the National Treasury of about 200 rubles per soul, which would bring me around 200,000 rubles. And the time to start is now. This epidemic, thank heaven, has killed off quite a lot of people. The landowners have lost at cards, have squandered their money on drinks and dinners, have rushed to Petersburg to get into government service, and left their estates to look after themselves, so they find it harder and harder to pay their taxes, and they'd be only too happy to let me have their dead peasants, if only to save on the per capita taxes. It could happen that some of the landlords might even be willing to give me something to take dead souls off their hands. Of course, there's work and difficulty involved in this. And certain risks, too, because the whole scheme might end in scandal. But then what's man got his brain for? And the best of it all is that the commodity to be transacted is too unusual to raise anyone's suspicions. True, there's the snag that peasants aren't usually bought or mortgaged without land. Yes, but then I can buy them for resettlement. Today one can get land in Kirkov and Tabriz provinces free. Just like that. Help yourself, so long as you bring people there to settle. So I'll send them there, let them go and live in peace in Curzon province. As to resettlement, it'll be above board with all the necessary papers, certificates, and registrations. And if they wish to inspect the serfs, well, then I'll present them with an inspection certificate signed by the rural police inspector. As to the name of my village, it might be called... Chichikova, say, or else, using my Christian name, Pavlovka. And this is how the strange scheme grew in the brain of my hero. Now, while I can't be sure that all this will find favor with my readers, I can assure them that I myself, speaking as an author, and am inexpressibly grateful to him for the idea, for if this plan hadn't occurred to Chichikov, this book would never have seen the light of day. So, according to the Russian custom, Chichikov crossed himself and set out to execute his plan. Pretending to be searching out a place to settle under, settle or under similar pretexts, he began a survey of our vast empire, investigating especially areas that had suffered from droughts, epidemics, and all sorts of other disasters. In brief, places where he calculated he had the best chance to buy cheaply the sort of people he required. He did not approach every landlord, but selected those he judged suitable. Then he tried to become acquainted, to gain their friendship, and whenever possible to have them transfer dead serfs out of sheer friendship rather than as a commercial transaction. For this reason, the reader ought not to blame me if the people we've met thus far aren't exactly to his taste. Blame Chichikov. For we must follow him wherever he decides to go. 
The only excuse I can offer if accused of dull and unattractive characters is that it's never possible to see a thing in its entirety at the start. When one drives into a large city, even a capital city, one's first impression is always of drabness, grayness, and monotony. At first there are endless factories and mills, all grimy and soot-covered. Only later will there appear the corners of six-story houses, stores, signboards, the broad vistas of avenues and squares with steeples, columns, towers, and statues, the glitter, the noise and roar of the big city, and all the other marvels that the mind and hand of man have created. The reader has already seen how the initial purchases were made, how our hero's affairs will proceed in the future, what triumphs and failures he'll experience, how he'll cope with even more difficult obstacles, how great will be the stature of the characters who will appear in the narrative as it gains momentum, how its horizon will expand, and how it'll acquire lyrical overtones, this the reader will discover later. There's still a good distance to go for the light carriage of the kind used by bachelors, occupied by a middle-aged gentleman, with his servant Petrushka and his coachman Selifan, driving the three horses already familiar to the reader, from assessor to the sly, lazy, dappled gray. And so we now know all about our hero, but people may feel that to complete his portrait, we ought to say something about his moral standing. It is, of course, easy to see that this particular hero is no embodiment of perfect virtue. What is he then? A villain? No. Why? Why must we be so severe in passing judgment on others? We haven't any villains today. Everyone around is well-intentioned and pleasant. And if one could find two or three individuals who've placed themselves in a position to receive a public pasting, even these would pay lips, even these would pay lip service to virtue nowadays. The best word to describe such an individual would be, quote, owner or, quote, possessor. It's acquisitiveness that causes all the trouble. It's to satisfy it that deals described as shady are entered into. No doubt there's something repulsive in all this, but the same reader who in actual life would make friends with such a man, eating and drinking with him and enjoying his company, will stare reprovingly if the same gentleman turns up as the hero of, an, of a novel or a poem. But the wise man despises no one. Instead, he watches him closely and tries to discover the roots of what he sees. Rapid changes can occur within a man. You may take your eye off him for a moment and then find a terrible worm gnawing within him, sapping all his vigor. And often it's not an overwhelming passion, but some petty, despicable one that burgeons in a man's soul, even though he be born for great accomplishments. It forces him to turn from really important things to find importance in dross. Human passions are as numberless as the sands of the sea, and no two are alike, whether noble or low. And while at first they can be controlled by the will of man, any one of them may later enslave him. Happy is the man who of all the passions, has been able to choose the most beautiful. Such a man can watch his bliss grow and multiply with every passing hour and penetrate deeper and deeper into the boundless paradise of his own soul. But there are passions that deny man freedom of choice. They are born at the same moments as he, and he cannot rid himself of them. They are part of a higher scheme of things, and they'll torment him throughout his life. They are destined to realize themselves here on earth, whether in sinister deeds or in acts which will spread happiness, they are rooted in him for reasons inscrutable to man. Perhaps the passion that drove Chichikov was something beyond him. Perhaps there was something in his barren existence that would later make men fall to their knees and kiss the dust in admiration of heavenly wisdom. And then, isn't it also a mystery that such a character should have appeared in this narrative? What depresses me is not that readers will be dissatisfied with my hero, it's rather that I'm fully convinced that they'd have been delighted by the man had they run across him in real life. If I hadn't looked deep inside his soul, if I hadn't stirred things up in the darkness at the bottom of it, things that would otherwise have escaped detection, if I hadn't revealed his innermost thoughts, thoughts which one man would never entrust to another, if I'd presented him just as he had presented himself to the whole town, 
to Manilov and to all the others, everyone would have liked him very much and would have accepted him as a very attractive person. But what use would it be to give him a live face, to make the whole of him come alive, if I'd then refrained from digging deep inside him? For what? So that having read my book, the reader should return unperturbed to a game of cards, the solace of all Russia. Yes, dear readers, I know you're not eager to be given a glimpse of the squalor of the human heart, there's no need for that, you maintain, as though we didn't know ourselves that there are many despicable, mean things in life. We have all too many occasions to see things that depress us. You'd have done better to show us something beautiful, something that would cheer us up. We'd rather forget unpleasant things for a while. Well, this would be tantamount to a landowner telling his manager something like this. Why have you come to tell me my estate's a mess? I know it. Haven't you anything else to discuss? All I ask of you is to give me a chance to forget all these unpleasant things, not think of them. Then I'll be content. Then the funds that might have put the estate back into shape are spent on various ways of forgetting reality. And so the brain that could have, who knows, found a brilliant solution puts itself to sleep. And the next we hear, the entire estate is up for auction. And the former landowner becomes a tramp prepared to commit crimes, the mere thought of which would formerly have set him shivering. I'll also be attacked by the so-called patriots. These people sit quietly in their warm nooks, engaged in affairs that have nothing to do with patriotism, amassing neat sums of money or arranging their lives at other people's expense. But should anything happen that looks to be an insult to the motherland, such as the publication of a book, that contains some bitter truth, they'll come rushing out of their crannies, like a spider when a fly becomes entangled in its web. Is it really right to air this, to publicize that, why all the things he mentions are taking place here in our country? What will foreigners say? Does he really think it's pleasant to hear people say slighting things about one's own country? Does he think it doesn't hurt? Doesn't he realize we're patriots and love our country? I must admit I have no answer to these clever objections, particularly the one concerned with what foreigners will think, unless, perhaps, I may tell the following story. Once, two citizens lived in a remote corner of Russia. One of them, the father of a family called Kifa Mokievich was a mild man who led a rather carefree existence. He was not particularly interested in family life. His interests leaned more toward the contemplative, what he liked to call, quote, philosophicating matters, end of quote. Now, he'd say, pacing his room, let's take, for instance, the beast. Well, a beast is born naked. And why is it born naked? Why doesn't it come out of an egg like a bird, for instance? Yes, the deeper you go into the matter, the less you understand nature. Thus reasoned citizen Kifa Mokievich. But this isn't the point. The other citizen was Moki Kifovich, his son. He was rather a giant, and while his father was busy speculating about the birth of beasts, his 20-year-old broad-shouldered nature was longing to let itself go. He could never take things easy, and something was always happening to him. A hand would crack in his powerful grip, or a lump would spring up on some nose. At home, everything fled from him, from the servant girl down to the watchdog. And he even managed to smash his own bed to pieces. Such was Moki Kifovich. But aside from this, he was a kind-hearted young man. But this isn't what I'm getting at either. The point is this. Please, Kifa Mokievich, sir, the father's own servants and those of the neighborhood complained to him. Couldn't you do something about that Moki Kifovich of yours? He won't leave anything alone. A regular pest, that's what he is. Yes, he's naughty, very naughty, the father usually replied. But what can I do? It's too late for spanking, he's too old for that. And besides, if I did, you yourselves and everyone else would accuse me of cruelty. I could, of course, tell him off in front of an outsider and he'd control himself because he's eager to get on. But then the whole town would know about it. And they'd say he's nothing but a dog. And do they think that wouldn't hurt me? Am I not his father? 
Do they think that just because I'm sometimes occupied with philosophy and haven't much spare time that I feel differently from any other father? Well, they're wrong, you know. I'm a father too. A father. A father, goddammit. A father, do you hear? And you know where Moki Kifovich is? He's here. He's here in my heart. And having thus explained his parental feelings, he left Moki Kifovich to continue his exploits and return to his philosophical speculations. Now, if, say, we assume an elephant were to be hatched from an egg, the shell of that egg would possibly be so thick that a cannonball couldn't break it. Therefore, some new type of cannon needs to be invented. Thus, these two citizens lived off by themselves until now, toward the end of our story. They've popped up like faces in a window. And they popped up like that to help me answer in all modesty the accusations of ardent patriots who, up until now, have been occupied in philosophical speculation or in the accumulation of money at the expense of the mother country they love so dearly. They don't give a damn whether or not their actions are harmful to the country. The only thing that worries them is that somebody might say they're harming it. No. It's neither patriotism nor even honest emotion that lies at the root of their accusations. Something else is concealed here. Why beat around the bush? Who's going to tell the truth if not the writer? So here goes. You're all afraid of a probing eye, afraid of looking thoughtfully into anything. All of you prefer to let your blank stare skim the surface of things. You may laugh at Chichikov, maybe even heartily. Perhaps you'll praise the author and say, well, one must admit he observes things rather cleverly. Must be a cheerful sort of fellow. And after delivering this statement, your expressions will become even more smug and you'll add, yes, one must agree with that odd, even ridiculous people turn up occasionally in these parts. Some of them outright crooks, too. But isn't there anyone among you who has enough Christian humility to ask himself? Oh, not in public, of course, but in private searching his soul, a question along these lines. Am I not even slightly somewhat of a Chichikov? Oh no, there's no danger any of you will, but just let some acquaintance of yours pass by someone of neither exalted nor humble position, and just barely restraining your laughter, you'll nudge your neighbor and say, look, there goes Chichikov, look at him. Isn't he the spitting image of Chichikov? I tell you. And then forgetting the dignity required of your age and position, you'll run after him like a boy, calling after him teasingly, Hey, Chichikov! 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 But we've been talking too loudly and in our excitement have neglected our hero who's been sleeping while we told his story. He might have been aroused by hearing his name being repeated over and over. We ought to remember he's a sensitive man who doesn't appreciate being spoken of without proper respect. I realize that the reader doesn't much care whether Chichikov is angry with us or not, but being the author, I do. We still have a long way to travel together, hand in hand.